Hi, everyone. This is Jen Grisanti of Story Therapy, Character, and Character Dynamics. I am thrilled to have with me today as my guest, David Schoner. Let me tell you something about David. David is like a total rock star. I remember at the beginning of my executive career, I came across uh, an episode of Once and Again that David wrote. And I was so blown away by his voice. I called his agent and was like, who is this writer? Uh, Cut to where we are today, where he is like at the top of his game, just finished New Amsterdam, has been selling, has an overall deal, has like everything going on. Like David is where you want to be. So you want to look at David, you want to listen to what he has to say, and you want to know that the dream is possible. And David is here to share his journey with you on what it takes to get to the dream. Thank you for joining us, David. Thank you for that introduction. You are... uh, Jen is one of my earliest supporters and cheerleaders. Um, so I am grateful to be here uh, with you once again. Oh, so, so grateful for you to be here. Uh, starting with like your voice with playwriting, like when you first thought about writing, I certainly love playwriting as a background for television writing. There is a depth, there is a humanity, There's something thematically that is in playwriting that I feel like transfers so well to writing for television. When you were first thinking about getting into playwriting, what was the impetus that made you want to write? It was a total accident. It was, um, I went to a performing arts high school in Miami and it was the, the dean of the school was the person who um, started the fame school in New York. So you were a direct descendant of my light just died. And let me, let me turn on this. Let me open this up a little bit. Great, thank you. A little bit better? Oh, yeah. that works. Yeah, that um, works great. So, and there was a college attached to the high school. We were in a downtown building. So it was very atypical. What happened was they ran out of acting teachers for my program. And we were up in arms. This is, you know, you call yourself an acting academy. Um, and keep in mind, it's a public school. We were all very entitled. And the teacher said, I'm really sorry. We ran out of acting teachers. All we have is the playwriting teacher from the college department. So we got this playwriting teacher who's like, look, really sorry, you guys. Can't teach you anything about acting but I can teach you about playwriting. And maybe you'll find a way back into acting knowing how the playwright thinks. So we started doing these writing exercises and something clicked where it felt like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I'm really good at this, maybe better than I was as an actor. Um, And that's how it started by accident and uh, we were all really upset. <laughs> How blessed we are that for that accident. So what a wonderful, wonderful thing. So in touching on what you just said with that, you saw that you were good at it, perhaps even better than acting. When you think about belief, as far as belief in your message and what you have to say to the world, at what point would you say that you felt belief? in the message that you were delivering? I don't, I I still struggle with that. Uh, Which is great for writers to know. That's great. Right, right. I, 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 I do this because besides waiting tables, which I'm phenomenal at, this is really the only thing I know how to do. Um, and I know how to make an audience laugh. I know how to get an emotional response from an audience. And in the theater, it's all immediate. 
And so you know when people are crying or you're getting a laugh. Um, one of my first plays we did at the Old Globe in San Diego, which is a theater in the round. So sitting in the audience, I could see people crying. I could see where they were crying. Like, it was a great experience for me to gauge what's working and what's not working. And so that's really addictive to have that much power, to be able to move several hundred people at the same time, to have them go exactly where you want them to go. Uh, and that's really about craft more than about, I have something important to say to the world. So I've just kind of focused on that piece of it. Um, and it wasn't until New Amsterdam where I could really speak to where the country was um, about our healthcare system, about where we were socially. So taking on those issues was a, one of the blessings of New Amsterdam because it was a contemporary piece about what brings people to the hospital, what makes our country sick. So I got to, I got to uh, elevate a lot of the voices in the writer's room um, to speak to those issues. So I love that. And, and can I tell you, like, I think the reason I gravitated more so to streaming versus network had to do with depth, had mm -hmm. to do with where you would go with the character and to see what you did with New Amsterdam and to see how deep you still went into things like so drew me in and so made me love the show uh so i love now now as far as it's interesting so i love that you're you were able to hit issues that are currently going on and dig deeper and like go into what you talked about with emotion and the desire to elicit an emotional response from the audience what about your emotional truth do you go into your emotional truth a lot with what you are writing? And did you ever have fear with the exposure of that truth? No, I never had fear. And I, you know, it's a lot easier for us writers because we're alone. It's just us and the computer. Uh, I can be very emotionally vulnerable by myself. It's not like the actor who has the 100 crew members who have, you know, who has the director, the writer, the producers waiting to pounce with notes. It's a lot easier for us. I, the hard part is when it gets <laughs> broadcast or when you're in the theater and you're like, your mom or dad is sitting in there watching a play about their divorce. You know, that's a lot harder, but the actual putting it on paper is pretty easy. I love that though. See, I love that you tapped on that because I feel like so many people will say things like, I can't write about that now because they're still alive or I can't. And yet when you just talked about that picture, I visualize your parents in the audience with you hearing how you experience something emotionally and how it probably added intimacy to a relationship for them to have some sense of how. So I love the idea of moving past that fear. Now with New Amsterdam, you and I talked before this call. So I, I know in reading some of the wrap up of the show that it kind of came to an end and yet there was some feeling of wishing that it were moving forward. How was it ending a show that was so pivotal for so many people and had such a massive following. How was it ending? Did you feel the stress of ending it in a way that that would fulfill the audience? Well, it, it, I mean, it's a it's been a real emotional roller coaster. Uh, we did ninety two episodes, five seasons, include and then a year for the pilot. So I've been with it for six years. Wow! And we had enough stories and we had enough creative juice to keep going. Um, so 
getting that call that we were going to end after 92 episodes was really hard. But it was a blessing to be able to end the show on our terms, which so few, especially in broadcast, so few shows get to do. So I'm grateful for that. And, you know, every day is like, uh, you, you know, you're like really upset. And then other days you're really uh, proud. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, even when it, even when the writer's room broke, I still had months of shooting left. And even when we wrapped production, I still had months of editing left. And even when we finished editing, I still had a couple mixes to do. So I kept delaying the, I'm like, I'm still working on the show. It's not over. So it, for me, it just ended like four weeks ago. Like everything ended. And so I'm, you're kind of in it right now. You're kind of still in the emotional part yes, of it. I'm yeah. very like, uh, it's almost like um, if you're in a long-term relationship and you're like, well, you know what? I'm, I'm excited to see what's out there. I'm excited to enter the dating pool again. And then you get the dating pool. You're like, oh God, no. Like, <laughs> no, like get me back. Very well put. Very awesome. well put. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm experiencing what every single writer goes through right now, which is, am I going to sell? Am I ever going to sell my next show? Yeah. Am I, should I write a, should I just spec it instead? Uh, no one sees my vision. Uh, the executives don't get me. Uh, yeah. So, you know, and I'm, you'll see this office, you know, you'll see the like, like, okay. I, haven't, I haven't been in this office in six years. I've been in, you know, these beautiful office suites with like, you know, just these gorgeous buildings in New York and, uh, you know, uh, in Hollywood. And now I'm back in my little cubicle on the Universal lot where I was breaking New Amsterdam six years ago by myself. And it's like, wow, I'm, I'm back to square one in so many ways. So I, it's a I real love journey. That. I love that arc of growth and looking at, cause it's almost like, I feel like, I mean, I remember Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert talked about eat, pray, love. What if that was the last greatest thing she did and did a Ted talk on that. And I always love, the idea of that truth and kind of being in like the creative fear and utilizing the fear for that next great thing. Yeah. But, but understanding that it doesn't go away, no matter how high you get, the fear is there because you want that feeling of home again, where you feel seen and understood in what you have to say. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every, you, they used to, in the old days, have upfronts in New York, where when your show gets picked up, they fly you to New York and, you know, you could eat wherever, you, you know, everything's a write-off and you just, for a one weekend, you get to live like a celebrity. And I've been to three upfronts, but every single upfront, I'm like, well, this is it. I'll never be back and I'll never have, be treated this well again. And then the second time I was like, oh, well, this is, you know, so every year I think it's my last. Um, that is the truth. I love that. But, but isn't it wild? I think when you look at these pinnacles in your career and you're like, you're, you're in the mindset of absorb this because this is the best it's going to be. And yeah. then it gets better. And you're just like, oh my God, I absorb this because this, yeah, it, it, it is fascinating. Oh, I love that. All right. So switching into pitching. Yeah. So I know that you had a huge, huge event happen with the sale of the Oaks uh, that was a million dollar sale. So bring us into that. Like, tell us about that, because that was all over town. So right. I, re I remember that. I was unemployed. I could not get staffed. I thought my career was over. It was the I, I, I guess it was maybe six or seven years into my writing career. And for the first time I could not get staffed. And I was really scared. So I decided to, I, cause I didn't feel comfortable pitching. I just decided to write a couple specs and use this free time, develop development time, you know, 
not unemployment, uh, to write a couple specs. And all my ideas had been for the stage. My original ideas were always plays. And I remember reading in Variety that Matt Reeves had sold a pitch, um, like a sliding doors pitch, about one woman who has one life in one reality and a different life in another reality. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do that for television. I thought television was all like very naturalistic realism and anything theatrical was for the theater. And so I was like this, and it just freed up my mind to be able to tell a theatrical story on television. So I decided to write a pilot about a house inhabited by three different families over the course of three different generations. Um, and there was a ghost in the house that connected all three time periods that ran through all the different characters. Um, and so I wrote it on spec and the, my agent had me go on a series of meetings to talk about my development. Um, I was taking time off of staffing to develop, right? That's how they pitch you. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and I pitched it to a couple places. I pitched this story of the Oaks to a couple places and, uh, uh, Little Engine was the, um, it was Gina and, should I forget their names, but Little Engine was the company. They had a deal at 20th. They brought me in the 20th and they just said, tell them about your show. I didn't have a pitch, but I just said, it's about three families living in the same house in three different generations and the ghost that ties them all together. And here's the script. And they'd asked me a couple questions, but I prepared nothing. Not like I do today. Right. And it lasted five minutes. And they said, would you mind waiting in the hallway for a second? And I said, sure. And five minutes later, they came out and said, we want to buy it. And I was like, great, amazing. Having no idea what any of this meant, because I'd never right. pitched anything. I'd never sold anything. And so my agent called and he said, uh, they want to buy your script, but we're not going to let them. I told them, you haven't been on any meetings yet. You don't know anyone in which is all true. Right. So staff to this point. But he said, we're going to, we asked for 24 hours to send the script out wide and then we'll let them buy it. Well, within 24 hours, every network wanted the script mm -hmm. uh, and it was just incredible. And it just, everyone kept bidding on it and bidding on it until the price went from 150,000, which is what 20th normal off, price, right? Yeah. Price until it got to a million dollars and Fox, 20, it was Fox and CBS agreed. They weren't going to go any higher than that. And I had to choose. So it was a, you know, it was a, it was an amazing week of uh, negotiations and, and. I love that. Well, and that's perfect for you to talk about what you shared about the story, because that brings us in. You're about to hear, you're going to be hearing pitches from this community. So I love that when you're, when you're looking at pitching now, Yes. Like if you now going into having gone through that, having hit peaks, having overall deal, what, how do you prepare now when you go into a pitch? What are some things? Well, I used to memorize it in the days before Zoom. Um, I used to memorize everything and I'd have little note cards in case I got lost. Um, now on Zoom, which is great, I just put my pitch up at the top of the screen and scroll through it and, and I read it verbatim. Right. I rewrite it so it sounds natural. I put in the ums, the, you know, I put in the non sequiturs, I put in the jokes. I, I write it like I'm writing a monologue for a character. 
Amazing. Just because I don't feel comfortable speaking extemporaneously. Um, but the greatest piece of advice I ever got was pitch passion, not plot. So I've started to strip out the plot and just pitch the passion for the project. And I say, literally, I'm gonna take you through the first act. And I take them through the first act, get them hooked, talk about the passion, my passion for this project. And then at the end, I'll say, and here's how we resolved those issues. Instead of going through like a scene by scene synopsis, um, something I just did for the first time was uh, I started pitching the show and every time I got to a new character, I'd stop and I'd say, let me tell you about this character now that you've just met them. And then I'd pitch a little bit more plot till I got to a new character and then say, now that you've met so-and-so, let me tell you a little bit about them. And usually what I've done is I've just had a whole character section in the middle, but I found it's just really boring because it's unconnected. That's usually when people lose yeah. the executives is the characters. Yes. Yeah. And it's all bullshit. It's all like, this person acts like this. This person is a scorpion. You know, this person has this personality trait as opposed to meeting them in the story and then seeing how they react to something. And hopefully it's really surprising and interesting. And the audience, your audience for the pitch is saying, I wonder why that character did that. And then I'll say, well, let me tell you a little bit about them. And so you're already leaning in and you want to know more as opposed to an information dump in the middle of your pitch. So I literally just did this after 20 years. Um, and I think it works for this, it won't work for everything, but it works for this specific project. Yes, no, that is excellent advice. I love that. I, I think it is all about figuring out what makes us lean in. I think it is a fascinating thing. Um, you know, it's interesting. I watched a TED talk that I told the class about on dopamine and oxytocin that talks about the fact that storytelling is like falling in love. And when, and you get dopamine and you get oxytocin going through earning trust through telling story, like you're talking about, which makes us lean in. Right. So, so I think that is fascinating. I love you hit, that you hit on that. Okay. Our last question. I would love to know that if you were to converse with your younger self, before all of this began, knowing what you know now, what would you tell yourself about writing? I would tell myself, and I, this is like my college self, um, to expand my, expand and broaden my interests. Because I wanted to be an actor for so long, an actor is an interpretive medium. I did not input a lot of things into my creative mind. I was so focused on being an actor that I, I remember sitting in the back of class reading plays as opposed to listening to the class and having raw material to work with as an actor. I wish I took more psychology and archeology span and sociology. I, I wish I had more raw material at my disposal. Um, and I just don't. So every time I start a new project, it, it, it's a, it's a re-education, which is one of the things I love. And, you know, I think writers will say, we love research the most, um, part of our job because it requires the least amount of work on our part. It's all about input. Um, and so I love that piece of it. Um, I just wish I was smarter. Oh, trust me, trust me, trust me. But, but I think it's interesting when you say that because I think that there are many people that wish they had more expansive knowledge, more expansive this, more expansive that. Yet when you think about the things that make us feel story, 
Hmm. are the ability just to observe and absorb and pass it forward, which doesn't, you know, which is, which is like emotional intelligence, which is better than anything else when it comes to story and the impact on the audience, right. you know? So, so I love, but I love that you talk about that because I do, I love, I especially love that you talked about the idea of re-education, the idea of going back research wise and the expansion of all the different areas that you don't think about when it comes to writing. I know psychology has been something I've studied from day one of being an executive. Like psychology is something that has fascinated me. So, and I use psychology and spirituality and story and meditation and all of that. So, so I think everything you're talking about is great for writers to be aware of. And, and the idea of now you're moving forward and you're moving forward with such an amazing uh, set of work behind you that is only going to expand further. So how, how exciting for you and how exciting for the audience. So thank you so, so much. Congratulations on all of your success. You. How blessed I feel that you are going to come and talk to the class and they are going to have the good fortune of learning um, from receiving your feedback. So thank oh, you so much. Thanks, Jen. You got it.